Hello, my name is Sarah Fishback. I'm from a small town in southeastern Massachusetts, and I'm currently a sophomore marketing major here at Hofstra University. I'd like to say welcome to all the Bristol residents who are here to join us for our talk today. I'm today I'm joined by Peggy Moss, who's a Bronx Zoo volunteer, and she's going to talk to us, to us about the role that animals play in our lives. Peggy has volunteered for the Bronx Zoo for 28 years. In this informative talk, she will tell us about her love for animals, and she'll share with us memories from her volunteer work at the zoo, as well as many trips from all over the world that she went on to study animals in their natural habitats. So let's get started. Thank you, Sarah. Why we love our pets? Well, let me tell you, as a child, I couldn't, we, I grew up with a dog and have always loved pets, whether someone had a cat or dog. In fact, much to the chagrin of my mother, I had a friend who would come over with his pet white mice, his guinea pigs, or whatever, and um, she was not thrilled that we would let them run around in my bedroom. So from that early age, I obviously loved animals, so once I moved to New York and became a member of the Wildlife Conservation Society, I found they had a volunteer program. And I said, whoa, this is just for me. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Bronx Zoo. It is uh, part of Wildlife Conservation Society, which started in, in 1895, about 119 years ago, and is comprised of five institutions. The Aquarium, the Prospect Park Zoo, the Queen Zoo, Central Park Zoo, and the Bronx Zoo, where I volunteer. It also has over 500 conservation projects in over 60 countries. Its park in New York City welcomes over 4 million visitors each year. And they help the city to educate millions of school children in science and conservation issues. I, as Sarah said, I have volunteered for 28 years. There are maybe three other volunteers there that have volunteered longer, maybe up to 35 years. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the volunteer, um, what we do during the week. You would volunteer one day a week, whether it's just a Monday or just a Friday. And you are very involved with giving tours to school children. And then your afternoon would be spent going around the zoo, educating the public. But seeing as I volunteer on the weekend, I'd like to deal mostly with that. And there, we are going around the zoo, working with the education department. Um, every hour, going to a different location. We start at 9.30 to get the updates, and we go to 4.30 in the afternoon. We also, as we're walking around, talking about the habitats, about the animals, we're talking about how climate change has affected animals around the world, the health of the animals, what we study with their conserv WCS conservation projects in the wild can help with our zoo animals and vice versa. By having a captive animal, we can study under more controlled situations to help our researchers out in the field. And when needed, also what we can help do, which helps brighten our days, is we get to help with birthday parties. We get to do membership tours as well as VIP tours. And I'd like to relate a VIP story. One of my favorite ones, I was maybe a volunteer just a few years, and normally we know ahead of time when we're having a, a VIP person come in. And I was having lunch when our day captain for the day came and said, are you busy? And I'm like, yeah, just having lunch. And they took me, and as well as one other person, over to the membership gate. And there we were waiting, and I could see there were three cards there, and I'm just wondering, what is going on? And the next thing I know, I am giving a tour to Netanyahu's wife and children, and there was another prime minister's wife. And this is when, back in, yeah, 1990s, and the UN was in session, so it was in the fall. And so besides... I was very fortunate to have her on my cart. I had the Israeli police, I had the New York City police, I had the zoo police with me. So as we went around the zoo, we were attracting a lot of attention. But it's not often that I have such a VIP. Normally, the VIPs could be major donors 
or prospective donors to our Bronx Zoo. I'd like to tell you about some of my favorite animals at the zoo. These are photos that I have taken there at the zoo. Um, this is a male lion. His name is Mawasa. Snow leopards you find in the mountain areas of Central and South Asia, like Nepal, Tibet. It's a threatened species because of its fur, as well as its habitat. This is an Amar tiger, which is also referred to a Siberian tiger. The other tigers would be tigers you would find in India. This is a giraffe. This giraffe is splaying its feet so that it could drink water. And out in the wild, they become very um, vulnerable in this state as they get water to their prey. Because obviously, it's going to take them a while to right themselves up and to run away. And they also, with that long neck, only have seven vertebrae. A little known fact, all mammals have seven neck vertebrae. Here's our latest addition to the giraffe family. This is James. James, like all the males born at the zoo, or females, would be Margaret, due to a large donor to our Carter Giraffe House at the zoo. This is a red panda. For years, no one knew. Was it a panda? Was it a bear? Who knew? So through much research, it has been founded that red pandas are a family and a class unto themselves. Even though we don't have orangutans at the zoo, great apes are one of my favorite animals. I took this down at a great ape reserve in Florida, and I just had to include it since I love great apes. This are our lowland gorillas. That's Tutti on the left, Julia on the right. Tutti's baby, if you look very closely in her arms, she would be the one in the front, the more vocal one, is two weeks old. Julia off on the right with her baby is six weeks old. Their father of the, of the babies is Ernie. There are two troops at the Bronx Zoo, so this is our most um, latest additions, and we're most proud. And this is Julia before she became pregnant. Julia's, all, like all our gorillas at the zoo, are very interested in humans. So she often sits right up front at the window, um, prompting the guests to do, stick out their tongues, do other things, because she'll stick her tongue back out at you. Whatever a human might do, she might do back. This is an ebony langur. Ebony is black. So you wonder, well, here's a langur, but it's not black. This troop, all is, are this blonde color, and no one knows the reason why, which then puts them up for being threatened and endangered because of that coloration. This is a red ruffed lemur, lemurs that you can only find on the island of Madagascar. A wolf guenon. If you look at his face, they're very expressive. And this is how they will communicate through various eye movements, nose movements. And we actually do have a baby wolf guenon. These are golden-haired tamarants, highly endangered, highly endangered because of their habitat destruction. And that was from the Central Park Zoo. Here you have a male mandrel. Note the coloration in his nose. This is to attract other females. He also will have a coloration on his buttocks to make him very attractive. And where you find that the males are more colorful than the females is most found in birds. Here's a gelata baboon. Gelata baboons, though you can't see here, their coloration is around their neck. They do sit mostly around on their buttocks, so they can't really use their buttocks to display an attractive female. Sitting on the ground like they do, it's that red ruff around their collar, which is most impressive to attract a female. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was wondering if I could ask you a quick question. Um, sure. You mentioned some of these animals are threatened and some are endangered, and I was wondering if you could just differentiate between the two terms, because we hear a lot of such an animal is almost extinct or endangered. So I just was wondering if you could explain that for us. Sure. 
the IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature, has come up with a list of animals that are threatened, meaning this is, they might become endangered, they're slowly, and then the, they are closer then to becoming extinct. So are, there are three phases that an animal population will mm -hmm. go through. So there's still enough viable population around when you're threatened. When you become endangered, those chances are narrowing, and then you become extinct, meaning that animal does not exist at all. So, for instance, there are only like 500 rhinos. Mm -hmm. That is becoming, that is a, a, it's close to becoming extinct, so therefore it would be a threat. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, because of volunteering at the zoo, it had prompted me that I needed to see these animals in the wild. So, I finally saved up enough money in 1991 and made my first trip to Kenya and Tanzania. And that was like having candy, cake on the ice cream. I needed to add more. So, after saving monies each time, as you can see, I have been to Botswana, which is the, Kenya and Tanzania is East Africa. Botswana is still part of East Africa, but you're going towards the central part of the state, of the country, Uganda. That was my first trip to see mountain gorillas, which is what I truly wanted to see back in 1991, but was unable to because of the fighting in Rwanda. I then went to Namibia, and that is on the west coast of Africa, and back to Kenya. All those photos, that eventually I will show you some photos of these animals, but I was shooting with my 35 millimeter camera. So those are in posterity are in photo album books versus shooting now digitally that I can readily access my photos. So I then went to Madagascar, and I will have some photos from Madagascar that we can see. Um, I did not include any pictures from Alaska, but the most memorable trip I ever made was to Antarctica. Um, I spent three weeks on a ship traveling around the continent of Africa in the northern part. I also went to South Georgia Island and the, and the Falkland Islands. And it is a, a place that is very hard to understand. There is no humans there unless you were to go to a base, at which is further south where not many people go, it's so frigid, um, but it is unbelievable. And as penguins, you are standing, and seals, you are literally, they're at your feet. I was sitting on a beach one day, and a little seal came and was just chomping away at my waterproof boot. <laughs> um, and then the trip I've always wanted to go to since I took my training at the Bronx Zoo, and they showed me a picture of a blue-footed booty, booby, and they also come with red, and they're bright red, bright red feet, or bright blue feet. And so I finally made it to the Galapagos. And then my last trip I did go on was to Israel. But I don't have photos there. But what was interesting about my trip to Israel is that I could see biblical animals there. Um, I did go to their zoo there. Mm -hmm. So if we could look at some of my photos. So here we are in East Africa with a baboon family traveling with their children. Here you have a vervet monkey, um, which are very common throughout Africa. Here we are in Madagascar, where this is a verosifica. Um, they're very colorful. I mean, they're not colorful, but it's, it's shading. And many animals have this shading, where they have that brown underbelly. So if you're looking up into the trees, it works as a camouflage because you might not see the animal. Yet the white around them from up above, because you're bright sunshine, it works as a camouflage in the sh in with shading. And many animals tend to have this coloration. Here we are in Antarctica with a chin strap penguin. Um, there are, I saw when I was there, over five different penguin species, and there were even more that I did not get to see. Here you have an Adelie penguin. This is an Adelie penguin that is 
was a youngster about to become a male. So it looks like it had a little mohawk because it's basically losing its baby fur. So all that was left was its little mohawk. Here you have a king penguin, similar in coloration to the emperor penguin. And the emperor penguin would have been further south in inland at the time. So there's some place we could not go. Here is a rockhopper penguin. The rockhopper penguin gets its name because it literally hops from place to place, as opposed to waddling or going on its belly in for locomotion and swimming across the, or sliding across the snow and ice. Here are Magellanic. This is on South Georgia Island. Magellanic penguins you might also see towards in the south part of South Africa. Many penguins do travel that far north to Africa, South America. Um, so again, if you just uh, so looking at the different penguins, you can see they have different stripes or different colorations. Some look more like they're wearing that tuxedo versus more some totally black and white. Here you have an elephant fur seal, so you get an idea of how tall those king penguins are. And I literally am standing just a few feet away on this photo. Here I was on a zodiac, which are large rubber rafts that you would take from your ship onto the continent of Antarctica. And this leopard seal was just lying on an iceberg. So it gets its name, as you notice, it's got sort of spots on it, thus its name for leopard seal. This is a petrel. It is a very large winged bird, it, and it's different, like a 10-foot wingspan. It's got that large beak um, flying around, and it will eat baby penguins. Here we are back in Africa with my, a male lion, and I literally was just, again, a few feet away. So sometimes I do crop my pictures up close, but more often than not, I am fairly close, just anywhere from 2 feet up to maybe 10 feet away from an animal. Here you have a plains or a bursal zebra, which is the most common zebra in Africa. And so quickly, if you look at this, you can see that those stripes, black and white, they're all over the body. And if we go to the next slide, a different kind of zebra, zebra is the grevy zebra. So looking at this zebra, you see there are no stripes on its belly. The stripes are narrower, and the face would be very much like a donkey. It's much broader and wider, and its mane sticks straight up. So there are two different kinds of zebras that you might find throughout Africa. Here we have an African elephant with its baby, and this baby was just a few days old. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about African elephants versus Asian elephants. If you look at its ears, they're much larger than an Asian elephant would be. Also a good indication, looking at that female, that ear looks like the continent of Africa. You can't really tell, but another difference is in their trunks. The African elephant has two fingers at the end of their trunk. Whereas an Asian will have just one little finger, a little tip at the end that they can pick up. Here's a, fe a female charging us. And elephants do come in female herds. The males would be off by themselves, just coming to mate. But another big difference between Asian and African elephants are that the protruding tusks that you see. African elephants, both male and females, have protruding or trunk or tusks that you see that come out of the mouth. Asian elephants, only the males will have these protruding tusks. Asian elephants are smaller than African elephants, but again, it's a very large animal, so who would know when you're right next to it? So if you look at their backs, an Asian elephant would have a slope, and the um, African elephant is more um, concave. Here we have a giraffe. So it looks very similar to the photo I showed you at the Bronx Zoo. 
here you have a male ostrich. Male ostriches are black. Females would be gray. This is called a secretary bird, and hiding behind that secretary bird is a small antelope called a Thompson gazelle. The secretary bird got its name because years ago in banks, the secretaries, as well as in other offices, often walked around in black tails, very formal looking. So thus, if you look at this bird, it looks like it's wearing formal mm -hmm. tails. Here we have a sleeping leopard. I am literally in my, in my van down below this tree watching this leopard sleep. Here it's very, it was, because I was so close and they were moving, it kind of is a blurry photo, but it's a Cape buffalo with a yellow-billed oxpecker on top, that little bird on its horn. The oxpeckers are birds that you will often find on the different animals that will be eating their and keeping the animal free of disease because they're eating the little insects and pesticides that might come on the animals. So you, here you have a Cape buffalo, often an animal you do want to keep away from when it's being charged, which I was in our van my first trip that we had one charge us. So I have that on video. Here you have a white rhino. And you can tell the difference between white rhinos and black rhinos by certain characteristics because this elephant, I mean this rhino and a black rhino, they're both gray in color. So it's not like one is white mm -hmm. and one is black. A white rhino has a very wide snout. They are also found in groups. A black rhino would be very solitary. White rhinos are on open plains. Black rhinos you would find in thick vegetation. This is a hoopy, which is a type of hornbill. Here you have a saddleback stork. Very prominent, very common in Africa. But again, because of its coloration, it looks like it has a little saddle on its back. This is an oryx, a large antelope. Here's a cheetah, the fastest land animal, running up to 70 miles an hour, just in a sprint. It's not there for long distance. I'm back in the Galapagos. Here it says a sally crab. The Galapagos, when you're there, everything's very colorful, which we'll see with other photos that I've taken. On to Madagascar, these are ring-tailed lemurs. When alarmed and they start running, note those tails are up in the air. Alarm, alarm. In the Galapagos, this is a land iguana. See how colorful that yellow is. Often have some red in the iguanas, on the land iguanas. This is a male frigate. Note the big red pouch. This male will inflate that pouch to attract a female. Again, talking about males being more colorful than females. And why I went to the Galapagos is to see the blue-footed booby. See on the little rock, his little bright blue foot. Here we just have a baby seal. That's a little baby fur seal. This is a vara sifaka and being fed. So as you can see, you are very, very close many times to these animals. And they also are very gentle. Um, I was very fortunate in that walking around, I once had bananas that we were feeding, and it literally just came down, uh, sat on my shoulder, and reached into my hand. It wasn't like you might have an interpretation of monkeys grabbing and being very vocal. Very, very gentle, very soft touch, as you might see here, trying to hold the hand to get the food. Fruit bats. Right here in the States, we have the common bat, brown bat, that eats insects, which is why we like them, because they'll eat insects and mosquitoes in our backyards. But over in Madagascar, we have fruit-eating bats, much larger. South America, you would also find fruit-eating bats. In the Galapagos, these are marine iguanas. So here you can see, you, 
living on the rocks, that coloration, they're blending in with the black coloration. They're not land iguanas that are colorful. And another reason of going to the Galapagos is to see the tortoises. So here we have two baby tortoises, and we go to the next slide, and you can see how big those tortoises are going to be. They, like all reptiles, grow throughout their life. They shed their scoots, or their backs, the back skulls, as what well, um, the skull, the topping, and underneath. And the latest. It was, um, let's see, this is 2004. In June of 2012, Lonesome George was the oldest living tortoise on the island of the Galapagos. He was the last of his species. He was a Pinta Island because the Galapagos is made of several islands. And when he died, he was over 100 years old. So even though this picture is not of Lonesome George, um, I was unfortunate when I went to the Darwin Center that he was hiding and I couldn't see him. But um, what was interesting to me is after Lonesome George died, he was shipped to the Natural History Museum here in New York to be preserved by taxidermists, and then he was sent back to the Galapagos as a symbol to their country and for the oldest living tortoise. Here we have baby Jintu penguins. So right now you can see they're very fluffy and furry and gray and white. They eventually will become black and white, looking very much like our tuxedo penguins that you're used to seeing. And you can see them in the background. And again, you can see how close you actually are. That is not me sitting there. That is someone else since I took the picture. Here we have ring-tailed lemurs up closer. And as I was explaining, they just literally would come down onto your head. So here you have a mother with her youngster waiting for some food. I was also fortunate to um, snorkel for the very first time in my life and was often snorkeling with sharks, which I was quite alarmed that I would be there with sharks and realized obviously not in any danger. My guide was still there underwater, but I did happen to capture this Stingray. So if there are any questions? Yeah, um, you were talking a lot about your trips, and you said you were interested in taking them because of your love for animals. But can you talk to us a little bit about how you went about these trips? Like, did you go with a group? Um, did you sign up through an organization? Like, kind of, was there a guide and a vehicle? And how did it happen? Yes. Um, basically, I always went with a group. Um, it was arranged through a tour agency here in the States, and then like in Africa, Madagascar, the Galapagos, they would be a local guide. Like in the Galapagos, everything is run by Ecuadorians. Mm -hmm. So that was, to me, very interesting because they take great pride in their country, and they employ local people. In fact, what was also interesting is that because on our ship there were diff our guides were from different islands. Mm -hmm. There often was competition so that when we would make a landing, we were told, this is the best island. And the other guy would go, oh, no. So there was a little you know, competition between the two. And our local guides in Africa, um, they, were, they, went to, they often studied for over two years. They had to take exams. They would be incredible in that Africa has so many different bird species. Mm -hmm. And you'd be driving in your open vehicle, or sometimes they'd be closed vehicles, and they just raise the roof so that you can stand to take pictures. And off, way in the distance, they would point out these birds, and I would be totally amazed. Or you would think, how hard would it be to see an elephant? It's a large animal, a giraffe. But they are so well camouflaged in the country that um, it's a, you couldn't get through the country or any of these places without having local guides. Right, perfect. And um, again, about your trips, which trip would you say is your favorite or the one that you'd most like to take again? And which trip do you think you would is your least favorite trip? I get that asked a lot. <laughs> um, I like to say all my trips are memorable. I think you cannot forget your first trip. And my first trip being to Kenya and Tanzania, I was there during the migration. And it's something to be behold. 
but yet if I was to tell someone to go to Africa, I would actually tell them to go to Botswana. I was in there, I just loved the country, there was no internal strife, everyone truly loved being there, they were very concerned about the environment, um, the camps, they were small, um, so that we often ate dinner with our guides. Because I went right after the rainy season, we didn't drive from place to place. We had these little tiny 10-seaters, 3-seaters. So we were often flying with the pilot. In fact, the first time I got on the plane, I was a little concerned because the pilot looked to be 18 years old, <laughs> younger than you. And I, was, I really thought he was still in high school. I was a little worried, like, how long had he been flying? So, yeah, I think, but, so I've, in Af that's what I would say about Africa, but then again, talking about Antarctica, it is a trip that not many people make. The country, because of Antarctica, you cannot have so many people there visiting as well, so even when you go onto the land, you're only the allowed there to go a certain amount of time. It's, they're very strict about not overpopulating the continent and destroying the continent since nature itself is doing a lot in taking away the ice from the continent. So, I don't know, it's tough. It's really tough. Um, I don't think I could ever say I have a least favorite country mm -hmm. um, because each trip was truly memorable. And because I went with small groups, um, one was actually organized through the zoo. We were very fortunate that they offered that to the volunteers. Um, it was a, it was for staff members. I did go with a curator of mammals when I went, so that was very exciting. But it was a, we were sort of like a pre-trip to see for, that they were going to open this trip up to their members. Mm -hmm. So um, very fortunate in all my trips. Um, sorry, <laughs> um, no. Um, so about, I know climate change is a big issue that um, people are talking about now. Can you tell us a little bit how that will affect um, animals in the wild? Oh, drastically, <laughs> drastically. You can look at the polar bears um, because of the warming of the global warming, that they're losing their habitat. So here's an, I'm actually thinking that could be my next trip, is that I need to see polar bears before mm -hmm. they do become extinct or only being able to be seen in a zoo. Um, it, it's truly affecting habitats, I, in my opinion, um, that because they're losing habitats, um, climate and so overpopulation can add to that. And I think also because of the climate changing in the world, it's, it affects human population as well as animal populations. So there will be a lot more species that are going to become threatened, endangered, and extinct. Um, all right, I guess now moving from um, your talk about your trips, maybe to go back to a little bit about um, what you like to do at the zoo. Um, how about if you tell us what your current favorite exhibit is at the zoo, the Bronx Zoo? Mm -hmm. Well, even though the, I, because I do like primates, and the Congo would be my favorite exhibit to see um, the apes. Um, it's just because they're very close. There's large windows that once you get to go through the exhibit, they interact with you. So you really can see how these apes are very much like us in what they want, if, especially if you come with a little baby. The youngsters, when they're getting a little bit older, like Julia and Tutti's kids, once they get away from their mother, will come right down to the window and stare at a stroller at this little baby that's in there, wondering what it's doing over there. So you really can truly see behavioral things happening with the, with the apes. Okay. Um, so you touched a little bit upon how similar primates are to humans, but can you tell us exactly kind of about DNA? Like how much does human DNA, is how much is it similar to ape DNA? Well, the great apes are chimps, orangutans, and gorillas. And the chimpanzee has been found in their DNA to be closest to human DNA, closest by 98%. So you can't get very much, you know, there's not much closer than you can get than that. Um, there's still a lot more research going on. That's why there are all these conservation projects out in the wild to find that out. Um, so I, that's why I like the 
primates. Mm -hmm. um, how about um, your most memorable interaction with an animal at the zoo or, or on one of your trips? Well, on my trips, I was very fortunate when I was in Namibia, I went to a cheetah reserve and I had met the founder and so she knew we were coming from the zoo and we were out in the field. She also raised a baby um, cheetah. So she had this cheetah but that would follow her around. So we literally were out and this cheetah walked right by me and I was petting. In fact, I have a photo with her, Lori Marker, and, and the cheetah. So to be able to do that and, mm -hmm. and another place I was right next to a rhino, feeding a, you know, touching a rhino, feeling that tough skin that the rhino has. So again, being up close and personal like that, um, you can't ask for that. I mean, these are truly wild animals, and that's what I kept saying to myself. I'm not in the zoo where they tr there are wild animals, but there is certain uh, control over a zoo animal because you have to be able to tell that zoo animal to go outside to, to, for the exhibit, to come back into its nighttime enclosure. So. At the zoo, years ago, one of the things volunteers could do would be animal handling. So you definitely had to have been there at least two years, but they don't do animal demos anymore. Mm -hmm. But that would have been one of the exciting things, because why I became a volunteer, another reason, um, is that I had a fear of snakes, and I think many people do. I actually do. So that's there you go. Yeah. And you can be totally surprised, because snakes are not slimy. They are truly, I mean, very muscular. So, in fact, with my animal demo, snakes, and these were not poisonous snakes, these are <laughs> constrictors, became my favorite animal to hold and to talk about because they really just kind of sat around there. You know, they sat in your hand or, you know, you could hold them. Unlike if I was holding a ferret or a, another mammal, I had to worry that this animal might be biting me because it has teeth. Or if I'm holding a large bird of prey, I've got to keep that bird up high above my shoulder. Well, then your arm gets <laughs> tired holding it. So actually, snakes became one of my most favorite animals. Um, they're very sensual. They're very, as they move and go around you, they're very, you'd be totally amazed. Okay. They're very nice. Um, and then I guess just a few more questions before we open it up to everyone else. Um, you said that obviously your love for animals and your volunteer work is what kind of got you started, but I can imagine that there are some sort of like scary things that might happen when you're with the animals. So are there specific safety measures that are in play for the volunteers at the zoo or um, for a person who's on one of these trips? Oh, yes. I know on my trips um, there's always security. I mean but they don't make it known to you. I mean, it becomes very subtle. I do know when I was in Uganda and I went trekking mountain gorillas, we had, besides our guide, there were um, patrols. So there was someone out in front of us with their rifle and someone in behind. So depending on how you were trekking up with the guide, if you were up front, you really saw them. But he usually was up front because it was near the Congo and there is internal strife between the countries. Or a lot of times just driving around, you would see military police or mm -hmm. checkpoints that you had to go through. But, you know, you're sitting in your, you know, might not, someone might else not, might not have noticed because you're so busy looking at the countryside and the people and whatever. Um, or they don't let you go someplace if there is a threat. So traveling, and that's why I would recommend going with a group uh, or with a reputable travel agency, they're going to make sure that they're, you and everybody else are safe. And at the zoo, there are serious precautions that be taken. Um, again, being there so long, I was, once a animal had escaped, I think it was the bear, early in the morning. So they held off opening the zoo, and it truly didn't open, it wasn't, it didn't escape into the zoo proper, but it just wasn't in its enclosure. I mean, there are certain procedures that when an animal is released, they go through certain areas. To before they finally get to their outside enclosure. And it just wasn't there. It had left and was in a different area that it shouldn't have been in. So they didn't want to take chances that a door might have been left open and that animal could escape. So that's happened a few times. Um, 
over the years. And so they usually, um, if it's during zoo hours, will keep the population away from a particular area. Um, and then I, I guess just a, a follow-up. Um, you're obviously very knowledgeable, but so can you tell me a little bit about, is there education that goes into being a volunteer or like other training or how sort of did you get to know all you do know? Yes, there is training. You um, go through an interview process and then once in the fall there is a, it can vary anywhere from 12 weeks. Um, I think when I went it was either 12 or 16 weeks. It's sometimes been 10 weeks, depending on how the holidays fall. But literally from September to December, you are coming every weekend, usually on a Sunday, and you are there from 10 to 4 learning. You are in the classroom in the afternoon. In the morning, you are there giving tours around a particular building, around the zoo, so you become familiar with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, have a lunch break. The class could be maybe 30 people, 20 people, depending. And you are broken up into smaller groups where you have mentors, senior guides that have been there for a while that are there to answer your questions because you do have homework that you have to do and you turn it in. Um, so this ment your mentor reviews your homework, making sure you are getting and understanding the concepts, the mission of the zoo, and everything else that we want to be able to talk. And you do learn about the different animals. So yes, it's a process. That sounds awesome. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so we're just going to open it up for questions. Um, so our monk, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Where are the animals tranquilized? Where are the animals ever tranquilized? Are the animals ever tranquilized? They are sometimes tranquilized because we do have a health center at the zoo. So if an animal is sick and needs to be brought to the health center versus being treated at their own nighttime enclosure, then yes, they could be tranquilized, especially when you have a larger animal, maybe. Um, so yes, they can be tranquilized, but it's only for health reasons and um, I would basically say to, for transportation, because sometimes an animal might be moved from one zoo to another zoo for um, for mating purposes. So that's when you tranquilize the zoo, um, the animal. Okay. Um, East Meadow, do you have any questions? East Northport, do you have any questions? We're an assisted living facility, so obviously you can't volunteer. What do you do to discuss with sick care of animals? We want to know what we can do at our level to stop the extinction of some of these animals. I'm going to repeat the question. I'm assuming everyone heard it, but just in case, what could you do to stop the extinction of the animals? Well, a lot of times, um, pet trade, depending, like if you're talking about parrots, many thousands of parrots are die, die and just to, for you to have one parrot here in the United States. So there you're losing, a, you know, many animals. So pet trade can help. You need to have domestic animals like dogs, cats, or animals that are definitely bred for domestication or for pets as opposed to bringing a wild animal here for pets. Um, a lot of times it's also, you know, what's going on now about recycling, about preserving the, the land that we live in. And you could do that even with fair trade products. It has to do with lumber that you're buying because if you're getting rid of the habitats where this, these animals live, then you're adding to their threatened status towards extinction. Um, Lynnbrook, do you have any questions? Uh, we have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Massapequa, do you have any questions? Yes, we have three. Okay. In the Bronx, in the Bronx Zoo, are the African plains still in existence? There were little cars that took people around in that part of the zoo in the past. 
the African plains exist, you walk around. It's a huge plain area. I'm not sure when you're talking about the car, if you're talking about the Bengali Express, which leads from the Asia, where you, it's the only place to see the Asian elephants, as well as many of the antelope and deer species, and a tiger, a Siberian tiger. But the African Plains, one of the oldest. Next question from you. Who finances the zoo? It is done by private donations. There is a budget that we will get from the city. It is a small percentage. So that is why often when the zoo or the budget is being done through the city, that there's often petitions going around and phone calls and different things around the city because we do rely on the small budget we do get from the city. But it's mostly private. It's mostly private. Okay, our last question is, you have shown us many pictures of animals with bright colors, more so males than females. Are there any female animals that have brighter coloring than males? Hmm. Um, that's a tough, I have to think, you know, you're going back, probably, I can't think off the top of my head, because more often when I think about the females, the males it's the, are also brightly colored, so you don't see the sexual dimorphism there, the difference of coloration. So I'm sorry I can't quickly answer that off the top of my head. I'm sure there must be, because there's always an exception to a rule. Um, North Hills, do you have any questions? North Hills, do you have any questions? Unmuted. North Woodmere, do you North have any Woodmere, questions? Do you have any questions? I am not sure if you can hear us. Yep, we can. Yep, we can. Oh, okay. I actually do have a question. Um, what percentage of the animals would you say are in danger that are at the zoo right now? Um, uh, question was, question how many was the, zoo, how the zoo animals, the zoo are, animals are, are in danger now? I'm thinking versus endangered versus threatened, because there are quite a lot that are threatened. <sighs> Knowing that there's over 650 different species at the Bronx Zoo, I would probably easily can say if they're not threatened or not endangered, they're at least threatened, I would say 75% of them. Okay. Um, Westbury, do you have any questions? No questions, thank you. Okay, thanks. And White Plains, do you have any questions? All right. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, it was great speaking with Peggy about her experience at the zoo and with all of her animals. So thanks again. Thank you.